Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. The Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island are iconic symbols of freedom in American history. Imagine if your company was the one selected to do major construction and restoration projects at these landmarks. In today's episode, Carrying the Torch of History, we will be speaking with Doug Phelps, owner of Phelps Construction Group. It was Doug and his team who were awarded these challenging and exciting projects, which included the construction of the Statue of Liberty Museum and the Peopling Center at Ellis Island. I'd now like to welcome Doug to our show. Welcome, Doug. Thanks, James. It's great to be here. Fantastic. Doug, I'd like to start off by asking you, where were you born and raised? And can you tell us a little something about your family roots? Sure. I was born in a little town called Webster, New York. It's just east of Rochester, New York. My family's been here for for forever, so they, they really didn't come over recently. My father was English. His roots go back, I think, to the Revolutionary War, and my mother was German, and they came over sometime in the 1800s. Your family's got some pretty deep roots in this country already. Yes, yes, they do. Yes. Okay. Were they primarily from the Rochester area or were they from other places as well? My mother was basically from the Rochester area. My father's family really was from, I would call it, northwestern Pennsylvania a little bit, a little town called Williamsburg. Okay. So, Doug, when you were growing up, what were your interests? What were the things that you liked to do? Did you have hobbies? Were there sports that you liked? Yeah. Growing up, we did a lot of camping, a lot of fishing, a lot of traveling. My father was big on traveling around the country. We actually, when I was eight years old, my father and mother took me and my other two brothers, which I still can't fathom how they did this, in a camper across country for eight weeks. And I was eight, so my older brother was, so we were eight, 11, and 13, I believe. I, I just, I don't know how they could have done that, but they did, which was great for the family, but I don't know how they put up with three boys in the back of a station wagon traveling across country. Oh boy. Now, did they need a vacation after that vacation? Doug? Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure they did. I don't, I, again, till this day, I don't know how they managed and did that and kept everything, everybody happy and everything seemed to go quite well. So uh, I'm not quite sure I would have needed a, a, a long vacation, but uh, they did well. I agree. Did you have any hobbies yourself or were there things that you started to take an interest in early in life? Yeah, I was always into building stuff, especially I think my father brought, put that into me. We actually, you know, we built a canoe once, but I, I was always into building stuff. So, which made it easy for me as I got older, you know, went to college to do construction over the summer. I was actually a roofer. I always like to build things still to today. Obviously, I, I like to build things. So. Yes, that you do. That's for certain. So you mentioned education. Where did you end up going to school? I ended up going to Syracuse University, which was about a little less than two hours from where I lived. I actually started out in microbiology and ended up being an economics major. I think I found quickly that uh, biology or being a, an economics major made, a, you know, it was good for school, but probably not something I wanted to do long term. To do something hands-on, I think, is, is what I learned through college. So very much hands-on. Yeah. When you graduated from college, what did you do? What was your early part of your career? So early on, it was so I graduated in the early 80s, and I was in Rochester, New York, came back home. Rochester, New York was going through the time where uh, there's two companies in Rochester, New York at the time, Kodak and Xerox, and that's who everybody worked for. And Kodak was uh, not doing well, and either was Xerox. It was not a good economy. I did a few things. I tried to sell copiers for a little bit and realized that wasn't my forte. Ended up landing with a company that did doors, frames, and hardware. I was in their office as an estimator. Probably did that for about a year. And then they had some jobs in Manhattan. 
and asked me if uh, they needed somebody to service them. They needed somebody down here to run around to the jobs and they, they looked for a volunteer and I raised my hand and off I went to uh, move from Rochester down to Monroe, New York, where I lived for about a year and worked for that company. And where is Monroe, New York with relation to Manhattan? Uh, Monroe, New York is a uh, Northwest. It's right where Route 17 comes into the throughway. So it's about 45 minutes Northwest of Manhattan. So when they were doing jobs there, I had a couple of jobs going in Manhattan. So I serviced those jobs for a little while. And then their work down here kind of dried up. And I decided that uh, they wanted me to come back to Rochester. And I decided that no, that's, that really wasn't in the cards for me. I kind of wanted to stay here. Had a lot of friends from college who were down here. So I ended up staying in the area and looking for work. Now, Doug, when you were in Manhattan or working in Manhattan or around Manhattan, did you start to see some of the famous tourist sites when you were down there? Sure. When I moved down here for the job, one of the first days I went into Manhattan, I believe it was actually the first day I had physically ever been in Manhattan in my life. So of course I was new to Manhattan and started taking in all the tourist sites and going up into, you know, the Empire State Building for the first time and doing the museums. And of course, you also went out and visited the Statue of Liberty. Yes, the Statue of Liberty. When you actually visited, what were your impressions? I remember that we actually back then, you didn't have to have a special ticket. So I did go up into the statue. We uh, waited in a long line and then went up this spiral staircase to get to the top and look out some dirty windows and get a quick little view of Manhattan and then go down the other stairs. And what I didn't really, thinking back now, I realized that, you know, that's what you did. You went out there. There really wasn't on Liberty Island anything but the statue to look at from the outside. If you were lucky, you could get up into it if you want to wait in a long line. But that really was, was all that was there was just a statue to look at and a small, tiny museum in the base that I don't even remember seeing. So I'm sure it wasn't very impressive. Didn't you ask yourself that famous question, is that all there is? Is that all there is? That's the question. Is that all there is to do out here today? And it was. You got back on the boat and went back, and that's all there was. Now, little did you know that you would become intimately involved with both Liberty Island and Ellis Island. Can you tell us how that started to come to be? Yeah, when, when I, so at, at that time, I was in my, probably my mid to late 20s. The farthest thing from my mind would be that I would ever have anything to do with any construction work alone, let on Ellis and Liberty. But that did come to fruition. I actually, after the job I had with the door frame and hardware company, I hooked up with a general contractor who we were actually trying to, to sell some door frames and hardware to. I went to work there, kind of gradually went from being a, uh, a you know, or an estimator, project manager, ended up being the CFO of the company and a partner. And there in the early 90s, we got involved in a project out on Ellis Island, which was really the renovation of what they call the carpentry bakery building. It's a building that's a little too off to the side of the main museum. And we actually restored that and made it into actually offices for the National Park Service. Really? And that was my first real work out on Ellis Island. And I, I really love the idea of the historic restoration and all the historic elements of it. And of course, it's, you know, you're working on a national monument always adds a little, uh, excitement. It was very big for the company I work for at the time. You know, it was really an exciting time for the job. It was amazing. And I only was playing a very small part in the project at that time. You're right. You were working on a national monument. That's a big deal. Oh, it was. It was. And we were working for the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation that was put in by, you know, Reagan and uh, Lee Iacocca formed that foundation, which eventually in, in the mid 80s, actually did the first restoration to Liberty Island and then actually built the, the first museum on Ellis Island. So it was, it was a very big thing that I was working for a company that actually was doing that work. So how did it progress from there? That wasn't the last time that no. you were going to be working on 
either of those two islands? No, we did quite a few jobs out there. And then really what happened was after 9-11 happened, they closed the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty closed that day and did not reopen for quite a long time, for a couple of years. One of the big reasons behind that was that after they closed it and then they went to reopen it, they realized how unsafe it was what they were doing. That yes, if you have 20,000 people coming over in a boat and they're getting in a long line and you're having them go up a spiral staircase with no way to get out. If anything was ever to happen, it would be a, a disaster for people who were up in the staircase or even just inside the pedestal. There really wasn't any proper way to get out. So we got hired by the firm I was working for. We got hired by um, the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation to do the life safety upgrades, which led to the reopening of the statue. One of those life safety upgrades was really to, uh, to shut down the staircase up to the crown. And we put a uh, glass floor in and we put all kinds of safety measures. We made new exits to make it safe for people. You know, later on, they did reopen to the crown. But what we really was going on out there at that time was that you only a certain number of people were allowed up. So, so really, the, the statue went from when I first went out there being a place where you could wait in a long line and go up to the crown to a place where you could go out there. And unless you had a special ticket that only 500 people had, you were only going out there to Liberty Island and look at, at the statue, which really, again, made that whole question about, is this all there is even less? You couldn't even climb up to look through the dirty window. No, you couldn't even look through the dirty windows. There was just nothing to do. You could go into a small museum and that really was it. But in 2007, I left the firm I was with and formed my own construction company, Phelps Construction Group. We had, that was in 2007. And then we went to work. We did a lot of work in New Jersey, a lot of work in Newark. Um, we actually did a lot of work at the Prudential Center, kind of started getting a name for ourselves. And in 2011, we were invited by the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation, who I kept in close contact with to bid on a project they were coming out with called the Peopling of America Center. Can you tell us about what that vision was? Yeah, so the Ellis Island uh, Museum, they wanted to expand it to tell the story, not just of immigration to Ellis Island, but all immigration to our country. So it was renamed the National Immigration Museum. And the Peopling of America Center was really two parts that would tell that story. There was one part of the existing museum that we were going to renovate to tell the story of immigration prior to the opening of Ellis Island. And then the Peopling of America Center was going to be a new section of the museum that would tell the story of immigration post the closing of Ellis Island. And that was really the Peopling of America Center actually was in the same part of the museum that the original Carpentry Bakery uh, project we had done. My first project was there. We had built those offices for the Park Service, and now we were going to actually demolish those offices we built and turn it into a museum, which was uh, kind of ironic. But uh, it, was a, it was a great way to get our first Phelps Construction Group job out there, which was very exciting at the time. I can remember to this day, the day we went in for the interview in the city and uh, met with the foundation and ended up being awarded that job. At that point, it was the most exciting, biggest, you know, maybe not the biggest, but it was certainly the most exciting and, and certainly the most important project we'd ever done, for sure. So, Doug, tell us what was involved in that project, building that center? Yeah, so we basically had to, we were working obviously in a historic part of the building. And our big challenge was that we were going to take a space that had, that was pretty broken up into different areas because it was, it was just retro, it first moved into just made into offices. So, and we had to open it up to make bigger rooms with big expanses. So it was a very challenging structural job to actually come up with a way to do this along with trying not to interfere with the historic fabric of the building as little as you could. And one of the things we had to do, uh, the original design 
called for us to build actually in the basement, big foundations and to drill into the ground. And there was all kinds of concerns from the foundation that we'd have to have our archeologists involved. This part of the building was, was part of an Indian burial ground at one time. And there were a lot of concerns about us doing that. So we ended up actually redesigning it, coming up with another way to do it where we could support it with beams and other footings so we wouldn't have to do that part of the job. Actually, it ended up being very cost effective also. So we were able to, to save the foundation of quite a bit of money and also do that. That was a big milestone. But the, the big thing that happened was we were about maybe 40% done with the job, maybe 50% done and Hurricane Sandy hit and entirely closed the island. So that really put a whole other spin on the project that we had to deal with. Probably blew your budget apart too. Oh yes, yeah, that, that was a game changer. Once the island closed, it was closed for over a year, sat out there, the whole basement of Ellis Island where all the infrastructure, as far as the heating, the mechanical systems, the electrical systems were all in the basement. They all went underwater. The good news on Ellis Island was that the actual museum was at a high enough level that water didn't get into the museum. So it didn't destroy any artifacts, but it took a good two years for us just to, we were involved in the, uh, obviously the cleanup and the fixing up of what got damaged, but we also, you know, to get back on track of the job, it probably added two years to the schedule. Um, it wasn't until they opened it, you know, we didn't end up opening the museum until the summer of 2015 which was actually two years later than it was supposed to open. So it really, it really changed things. But in the end, everything got done and both areas opened in 2015. That was a great day for us, obviously. You know, it was exciting. It's always exciting to be out there working on, on Ellis Island. That was always a great thing for our company. Oh, definitely. You know, I didn't go to Ellis Island till about three years ago, our daughter, got us some tickets to go out there. And my mom came to this country in 1948. And although her records are at Ellis Island, she came from England. I don't believe she actually came through Ellis Island. Her records are there. And my father's family was here like yours since way, way, way back 17th century. Yet I got the chills. My wife and I stood in that big hall at Ellis Island. We both cried. We had tears in our eyes. The Great Hall is just an amazing, amazing room. It's moving to be out there to see all what people went through to get there and just, and to see, you know, to look back and see after Ellis Island closed, how that building went down and nothing was done with it. And for us to be part of, of cleaning that up and making, you know, another area accessible to the public so they can see all these historic artifacts and learn about what happened and how people came over here and the struggles that they had, not only just on, you know, getting here, but the struggles they had at Ellis Island themselves, getting released from the hospital and getting, you know, okay to leave Ellis Island. It, it's a moving story for people. It really is. First of all, it's laid out so beautifully there and the stories and the, the artwork that they use and the photographs just leads you through it. But I always thought about those families who were coming through and maybe one of the family members was sick yeah. and there was a chance that they may not even be allowed in. Right. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine yeah. being... No, to go someplace and they say that, you know, one of your family members can't come in. Yeah. The reality of it, though, you have to go forward. Yeah. You're, you know, there's no turning back. You're going forward and you're going to hope that family member either can catch up with you or, or not. And yep. that's... It was an amazing time. It really was. But it, they're beautiful. And, and you know, and we also, while you're over there, you've done some work for the, the, there's two foundations. There's also the Save Ellis Island Foundation that we've done work for them really on the south side, where all the, the south side is where the hospital was and all those other buildings that haven't been restored. But slowly they are, you know, starting to restore some of those buildings. To see that the real stuff is not being used and be able to play a part in putting that back to life and, and getting use out of it and at the same time restoring it to what it was is, is very, you know, rewarding for us. And, and that's why we really, the work we did at Ellis was very special and, and really meant a lot. Well, I am not an engineer. 
However, I am a huge history buff. I'm a serious student of history. I love history. And I am so thankful that engineers like you who care so deeply about the work that you do to preserve our history, that you're the ones doing the work. That just makes me feel very, very uh, happy. Yeah, and we're glad, we're glad. Well, we take a lot of pride in it. It's always, uh, and all the tradesmen take a lot of pride when they're out on Ellis Island, that, that they're working, uh, you know, working side by side with the Park Service and the foundation trying to really do some good and, uh, and really get these buildings back to where they should be. I think it's very important. Oh, absolutely. Um, as far as when you were working on Ellis Island, the, the Peopling of America Center, did you have any interesting finds while you were doing the digging? I know you mentioned that you rethought the way you did some of the work so that you would not interfere with any of the archaeology yeah. and the, the foundations and things like yeah, that. Yeah, one of the tasks when you're working out there is to try to not not dig in the ground if you don't have to. It's because that's where you, you know, you have to have an archaeologist. There's a lot of things to go with it. And we actually, once we're doing the, uh, we're doing an addition to the, the wall of honor. There's a wall of honor out there where people get their names inscribed. It's outside. It's a circular wall of honor. And we were adding to that, adding some straight walls to that. And we actually one day came across the bone. The archaeologist stopped everything. The job stopped. The whole thing stopped as we wait for this bone to get analyzed as to what it is. And all they ended up being a chicken bone. So it didn't mean anything, but it just, you know, it will stop the job. And so you need to be careful about what you're doing. You need to make sure when you're doing any demolition inside the building, you never know what you're going to find, that you may knock down a wall or open a wall. And there's another wall behind it that has writing that these people did while they were there waiting to, uh, you know, which you see a lot of out there waiting for their trip and they're stuck on Ellis for months. And there is signs of people writing on walls and doing those things. And you have to be careful. The last thing you want to do is to destroy something that had historic significance or what they say is, is you know, part of the fabric of the building. We laugh at the chicken bone, but it just shows the seriousness. It is. Of the foundation and the work that you were doing, whether it was a Native American, a burial ground or a construction worker in 1984 eating chicken. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. You don't know. You don't know what you're going to find. Yeah, but definitely. It, it's interesting. It's, yeah. but it's always interesting and it's something that's, that's taken very seriously. Yes. And thank goodness it is. Doug, you moved on to another project on Liberty Island. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So after we were done with the Ellis Island, the peopling of America, center, the foundation came to us and very early on got us involved with their plan to build a new museum out on Liberty Island. Actually, when they had gotten us involved, they still hadn't even decided on a location on Liberty Island as to where it would be, but they hired us to work along with them and their architects and engineers to design a museum that they wanted to build on Liberty Island to really make Liberty Island come back to life for people who, so you wouldn't go out there and say, is this all there is, that there would be something that people could go see. The motive behind it was at this point, after Sandy had hit and all this had happened, that roughly on a day in the summer, 20,000 people would come over to Liberty Island. Of those 20,000 people, Maybe they could get 5,000 into the pedestal to see the small museum. And inside the pedestal was the existing, was the original torch was in there. They could get in to see that. And maybe 500 people would be able to go up into the crown. So it left three quarters of the people who went out there, took a boat out there. And all they really got to see was a closer view of the Statue of Liberty. They were outside the whole time. They couldn't get inside anywhere. So there really wasn't anything to do except look at the statue and then maybe go to the gift shop, you know, buy a hot dog. That was it. There was no story to be told. There was nothing that told them about the statue. And so the idea was to build a museum that everyone who went out to the island would have the opportunity to go through to learn about the statue, learn the story of the statue, and really learn about about what it stood for, what liberty stands for, and what people think liberty stands for, and all, all those great things. 
So it was very great that they got us involved early, which was great for our company, obviously. And that started the adventure of obviously the biggest, most important job I've ever been involved in in my life. And really uh, something that really changed, I think, my company and absolutely changed my life going forward to be involved in such a high profile project. Oh, yes. And I want to hear about that story, but I want to just stop for a moment and observe that the Statue of Liberty is so closely entwined with Ellis Island because so many people who came through Ellis Island would perhaps see the Statue of Liberty and say, here we are, we are in the new yeah. world. This yeah. is our new life. This is, this is a new beginning. And they saw the Statue of Liberty as they were sailing into a new country. So it's very important that the two are very linked together and yeah. that that's why the foundation really covers both of those sites. Yes, it's the same national park covers both sites. So the park service, same superintendent, it's all really run as one national park and they're very tied together. I mean, you, you really, Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island, it, it's really when you go out there, you usually go to see both things. The boats run to both things. It's definitely tied and it's, you know, it's always part of, you know, when they put up the statue originally that yes, people came by that statue. That's the first thing they saw coming into New York Harbor, go by the statue. And then those boats mostly landed at, at Ellis Island for a time. Yeah. Yes. Now you mentioned something about people coming out there before the new museum was put in place, that there was the old torch. I'd yeah. like you to tell the story of how you got involved in the Liberty Museum project, and also what other work had been done on the Statue of Liberty prior to that point? So when we got involved, we got involved through the foundation. You know, even though they knew us and knew who we were, we still had to go through a, a process to get selected. And, and we went through that process, and then we were selected as the construction manager for the project. I'll always remember that phone call. Actually, I was at, my daughter was a sophomore in high school playing softball, and I was, I was at one of her games when I got a call from Steve Borganti, the uh, president of the foundation, to let me know that our firm was selected. And I'll always remember that moment. Wow. Um, but a lot of it was... Back in the 80s, they had refurbished the Statue of Liberty. That was the first big thing the foundation did. President Reagan got Lee Iacocca to start the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation. And their first task was to restore the Statue of Liberty, which they did and opened in 1984 on July 4th. One of the things they had to do was the torch that's there now is a replica of the original torch. The original torch in 1917, they got this great idea that they were going to go up there and they were going to cut the torch, the actual torch. They were going to cut little holes out of it, little square holes to open it up so they could put a light in there and the light would shine. And they put colored glass in these little holes, looked like a Tiffany lamp. Mm -hmm. It all sounded great. A problem is it leaked and it always leaked for years and years. So there was always issues with it. So in 1984, they decided they went back to the French company, actually, that made the original torch, and they had them build a replica of the original torch, which doesn't have glass in it. It's gold leaf of the flame. They built a new torch. They took the old torch off, put a new torch on her hand, and they took the old torch and they put it into the pedestal of the foundation of Fort Wood, which is what Statue of Liberty sits on. They put it into the pedestal down into Fort Wood where everybody could go inside and see it in the museum. Problem is they kind of then closed it in. They made the door close a smaller, they actually excavated and filled in around Fort Wood. So the walls are much lower than they used to be, but they had their, the torch in there and that was always part of the museum. One of the things that happened with our museum once we were in the design phase is that part of it, and it was actually a, a big part of the museum, was that they had to, uh, they had a gallery area that's all glass and that they wanted the original torch to be in that gallery where not only could you see it in the museum, but you could see it from everywhere in the island. So one of the things that was part of our job, we did get, we got tasked with moving 
the original torch out of Fort Wood, out of the pedestal of the statue, over to the new museum. Ended up being probably one of the difficultest things I've ever been involved in, in any kind of construction project. Uh, it was amazing. I can only imagine, I know that we have recently, when my daughter moved, we moved a couch through a narrow apartment yeah. door. Yes. <laughs> and we all smashed our fingers and grumbled and said, what a nightmare this is. And so we ended up pushing it out the balcony door dead and it worked. I can only imagine <laughs> what we had to do. <laughs> the scale of what you had. It was actually two years of planning before we finally came up with the way to safely move it. We had a few challenges. One, it didn't fit out the door. So we were going to have to take it apart and try to not take it apart as little as we could. We ended up only having to put it into really three pieces. And we also, at the same time, the Park Service, part of this project was that we could build this museum. They, they had a place on the island it was going to go. We could move the torch. We could do all those things. But we could not interfere in any way with the public being able to come to the island, see statue. We, we couldn't interfere in any way with the visitor experience. So we actually had to not only do all this work inside the pedestal in the museum, we had to take this torch apart at night, do it at night. And the, the whole operation only took about three weeks once we started it, but we had to take it apart into three pieces. Then we had to rig it at night to get it out through the door, which the one major piece took, we had to, it was, it was like a puzzle to move it in different directions to get it out. And the day it came out, it fit through the last opening by less than an inch on each side. It was an amazing task, but it all, it all worked out. We got it over there and put it back together and it now sits in the new museum. It was a few sleepless nights, to be honest few sleepless nights making sure that we got this thing out. And, and certainly the big thing was not to damage it in any ways. That would have been a catastrophe. What a treasure that you are handling. Yes. And the fact is you had to get it out. Now, if it hadn't cleared for the door, I mean, you would have had to sort of dismantle the base that it was. Yeah, we, yes, we were. The, the next option would have been into getting into huge masonry work and opening up the base if we couldn't have, have fit it through. But we were able to fit it through by just taking out the regular doors, the regular glass and aluminum doors, and still getting it through the big major bronze doors that are at the opening. And we were able to do it and get it over a fence. It was a lot of obstacles, but we were able to manage it. It was a big day in October of, I believe that was 2018, when we actually you know, moved it across the area of the island and, and put it in place in the new museum, which was much easier to put it in the new museum than get it out of the old museum. Oh, I bet. Definitely. So while you were not only having to do all this really delicate work and challenging work, but you had to make sure that it did not disrupt the regular flow of visitors to the island. Yeah. Yes. And also, I understand that there was some degree of media coverage. at the Yeah, time. yes, there was. There was. So we, we, you know, we did this project once the construction started. You know, there was a lot of attention. So you were under scrutiny of a lot of media, a lot of eyes were on us every single day. And so because of the public being there, we only had a small area, not much bigger than actually the footprint of the museum to work of at the one end of the island. So logistically, this was a very challenging project. It was very difficult. We, uh, and, and we're on an island in New York Harbor. So we did have to build our own dock. We made our own uh, lay down area in Jersey City. We had our own uh, tugboats and, and barges, and we barged everything, every screw, everything that's part of that museum, we barged over there. But a lot of that had to do with planning how we were going to build it from in the beginning to make sure it was designed in a way that was somewhat friendly to barging. You know, originally, the building was designed as a whole cast-in-place concrete structure, and we changed that to be more of a a pedestal being concrete and the rest of it being a precast concrete product that even though we had huge concrete panels, we could barge them over and work it that, you know, to try to minimize how many concrete pours we had out there. I mean, we did have days when 
We had pretty large concrete boards. We could fit 16 concrete trucks on our biggest barge, which always made me nervous, but, uh, but they got them on there and off and, and across the, you know, New York Harbor, it would go with all these concrete trucks on it, but it was a timing thing. It was always working with the barging guys and working with the concrete finishers and, and working with, you know, where the, the currents were and all kinds of things to make it, uh, make it work out. Yes. And you also were interviewed by news people while you were yes. doing this, particularly, I guess, when the grand opening took place. But wasn't yeah. there also an HBO special? That yes. Yes, there is an HBO special out there. It's, it's called Liberty, Mother of Exile. Um, Diane von Furstenberg was very uh, involved. She was the head of the fundraising committee for this museum. So she was very involved in the project. The HBO documentary tells the story of how similar the original, how the original money was raised for the pedestal by the, in the U.S. and, and in France to make the statue, how it was all, you know, it was all private funding and people giving donations. And they kind of, um, they backdrop that to how Diane did the same thing and how she got people, not only big corporations, but also regular everyday people to donate money to, to be able to build this museum and kind of played off that. And, and we got to be the people uh, during it, building the museum as you go through the documentary. So it was, it was different, certainly nothing I'm used to, but yes, we got to meet the HBO people and be on HBO and, and go through all those things, which, uh, you know, always, you know, it was exciting. It was exciting times. To be I honest. bet it was. How about morale on the job? How, how was the job it's, morale? Oh, it's fabulous. It's whenever you're working on either Ellis or Liberty Island, especially this one, we had some great people on our side, you know, some great superintendents out there working, but everybody was always happy to be there because everybody was always happy to be I'm part of this project. We always used to say, we feel like, hey, we're building something for our country to show off the statue to all the visitors from around the world. Yep. We're really doing something for our country. And everybody wanted to not only be there, but they wanted to make sure whatever they were doing was done perfectly, that it would be something that they would be proud of down the road and something they could take their grandkids to one day and say, hey, I, I was out here. I was building this museum. So it, the morale is always great on a project like this. Oh, that's wonderful. Now I asked you about Ellis Island, I asked you the same question. I'll ask you about this one. Certainly, I think you told me probably the most challenging thing was getting that torch <laughs> yeah. out and relocated. But what about any other finds? Was there anything during the building of the museum that you found that was interesting? Yeah, a few things. One, when we were building the museum, you know, and, and got started out there. Now the museum had to be, because of Sandy flood regulations, the museum itself and all anything that could be damaged by water had to be above a flood stage, which was about 15 feet above the uh, ground level, we'll call it. So we basically had to build a pile foundation that would hold this pedestal. So the area that we were building this was, is the area that really used to have residents on it barracks back when it was a military base and residents for park service personnel that before Sandy actually used to live out on the island. So there was a lot of unknowns as to what was under the ground, where things were. And we started the job off thinking those were mostly utilities. Didn't know where old water lines were, where all those kind of things. But the biggest challenge ended up being that the actual, as they built the island, Liberty Island, as it grew, and as the, uh, you know, they would bring fill out to go on Liberty Island, making it bigger, the seawall was constantly expanding. Mm -hmm. So there was seawalls under the ground that we didn't know where were. And when we would go and dig, we would find a seawall that was maybe from, you know, a long time ago, we couldn't damage those seawalls. Right. So we were constantly, while we were building this, uncovering seawalls and then redesigning the foundation to span these seawalls and to go around them, to not drive something through them, to do all those kind of things. That was, you know, very interesting. But I think the most interesting thing we found was we were actually part of the museum is also if you had been if you've been out there since since 9-11, there's 
there's a secondary screening tent that's out there. You get screened when you get on the boat. And then if, if you're lucky enough to be able to go into the pedestal or up in there, you go through another screening process. There's a big white tent at the entrance, covered the whole entrance to the pedestal. In my opinion, it looked terrible. So one of the things we did was we built a new secondary screening facility off to the side of the statue that would be used so we could take that tent down and open that up. Right. While we were building that, which is right next to the foundation of Fort Wood, we found what they ended up calling a counter scarp wall, at which I had no idea when we found this thing what this was. But what it really was, was Fort Wood was built in the in the very early 1800s, like around 1808. And at some point, as part of the defense of Fort Wood, they had built like this, it was basically a rubble wall that would be a secondary defense of Fort Wood so that you would have to actually, if you were to attack Fort Wood, you would have to climb over this uh, this rubble wall and then down into this lower area before you could even get to Fort Wood. Okay. So when we found that, that caused that project to come to a halting stop because no one expected it to be there, really. Uh, they knew it existed kind of out there, but no one had ever found it, but we found it. And it was right where the building was. We ended up being, we ended up cutting a big section of it out that they now have, and we moved it for them that they now have out there. And, you know, we were able to redesign and go around it. But the new secondary screening facility does sit on the, uh, the scarp wall from like 1815 or 1816 that was built there. So that was the bigger surprise. I did, we didn't expect to find that, but it was very interesting to go through that process. I would have loved to have seen that. Now, there's a piece of that. Yeah, there's a piece of that out there. Yes, we cut a piece off and moved it. So they'll always have a piece. It looks like they put mortar and every piece of you know rocks and bricks and anything they could find to build this thing. It looks like it was built pretty quickly. So I, I don't know the history of what was coming, but they certainly built it quickly. No, so, more of 1812, I guess. Yes, it might have been. Time, so, yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's really yeah. cool. I want to ask you to, to tell us about opening day, uh, the museum at Liberty. There was a great buildup to it. The day of what was going to be, not the opening, the day before the opening, when they were going to have the, uh, the grand, I guess you would call it the grand ball out there, or whatever, you know, the opening ceremony before the open, the night before they had, uh, you know, Good Morning America was out there. We had gotten interviewed by uh, CBS Sunday morning, the Sunday before it, that was on. And then that night they had a big event out there that, uh, and I'll be clear, I was totally out of my element, you know, with the celebrities, you know, Oprah Winfrey was out there, Jeff Bezos, uh, David Letterman, all these people. And when I knew I was out of my element was when I, we, before we were getting on the boat to go over for the grand ball, I'll call it. One of the uh, press people grabbed me and said, Doug, you know, come with me and me and my wife and come. You need to walk in here to talk to people. And we turned the corner and there was a line of people walking on a red carpet with all these people taking pictures and interviewing you. And I was like, well, they don't know who I am. But if you look back on that day on some of these things, you see there I am stuck in the middle of these celebrities with my name. So it was, it was exciting. It was something I could I never imagine, but uh, you know, they, they had that event, which was great. And then the next day they did the opening politicians were there and did the ceremony. And I have to say that uh, Steve Borganti, who was uh, president of the Statue of Liberty Island Foundation and Diane Toland, who was the project manager, they really went out of their way to give us recognition. And in my business, a lot of times we build a lot of schools, a lot of things. When it comes to opening it up, it's about politicians and, and the people that gave the money. And we were lucky if we even get, if someone says a word, they, they really went out of their way to thank us and to make us part of the event, which that for us is, you know, that, that's gold. I can never repay them for making sure that we got the recognition that I think we really deserve for what we did. We, you know, we were out there for two and a half years fighting storms and all kinds of things to get this thing built. And they appreciated it. And they really did. And that, that really made it for me even more special than, than it could have been. 
Yeah, I mean, you were so instrumental in making it happen. I'm so glad that they recognize that because yes. so, it's so important. It really is. Yeah. If I go out there now to visit that museum, what kind of things do I see? So if, if you go out there now, what I, one of the big things you see is when you go into the museum, there's what there's called an immersive theater. It's really, it's three pods that you walk through and there's a movie that was made and it really tells in about 12 minutes, you're not in there forever, but it's a good amount of time. But in about 12 minutes, it really tells you the story of how Liberty came and you know how the French built it over in Paris and how it was actually built standing in Paris at one point and how it came over here, how we raised the money to do the pedestal and then what it means to people. And then you go through the museum part, which tells a lot of, about what Liberty is, the statue has meant over the years to our country and people not only from, you know, you get to realize it's, it's the Statue of Liberty, and we all think of that as the United States, and that's our country. But what you really come to realize is what it means to the rest of the world. And why, when I'm out there, and I spent two and a half years out there, at least two, three times a week, I was out there all the time. And you realize when you're out there, two things. One, the amount of people that are out there that are foreign tourists, how important it is to foreign tourists to come see the Statue of Liberty. Yes. The bad thing is you also notice how few of the local people here come. One of the things that I always say is I was out there for two and a half years. I can count on one hand the number of people I ran into that I knew. People just didn't go out there. One of my hopes is what you see in this museum, which finishes with the Inspiration Gallery and the old torch now refurbished in its glory there, all relit. It's beautiful. It really is a moving moment. You see that? It's backdrop with the real Statue of Liberty out there. It's a beautiful, moving moment. And I really hope that people from New Jersey and New York that, you know, last time they were there, they were in seventh grade. They went on a field trip out there. That's it. To go now when I think it would mean a little bit more to you to go see it. I, I really think that's important. And I'm hoping that now with the, hopefully the pandemic ending, people will start to do things again and people can get out there and really see this. I think it's really important. Oh, definitely. When I mentioned I was out at Ellis Island about three years ago, it was the first time I had ever visited out there and, and it was just a wonderful experience. We passed Liberty Island. We did not get off. There was a massive line. This is in yeah. about 2016, I guess, maybe yeah. 17. So we didn't get off there. But, you know, we got a nice view of it. and. I remembered that my grandmother, who was born and raised in England, she took me to the Statue of Liberty when I was about eight years old. And I climbed those little steps yeah. all the way to the top. I looked out the dirty windows. And yeah. now, particularly after having this conversation with you, I am very, very, very interested in going back and seeing that museum yes. at Liberty Island. Yeah. And, and I think it's a great day for a local trip. It's something you can do in in a day easily. It's a really nice, a nice day out there. And if it's a beautiful day, the top of the, because it's, you know, we built this museum on a pedestal and then they, they wanted the, the museum not to overshadow the statue. Mm -hmm. So it has a green roof on it. It kind of falls right into, into the island. It becomes part of the island, but you can walk upstairs onto the roof. There's an area that you can go up onto a, a sizable area with one of the points that points right at lower Manhattan. And I'll tell you, there's no place you're going to get a better view of lower Manhattan than the top of that museum. It's, it's breathtaking to be able to look at lower Manhattan and turn your shoulder and there's the Statue of Liberty right there. During the construction, there was many days when maybe things weren't going exactly great. Mm -hmm. but I would, that's where I would always find my stuff. I would go up onto that roof and just sit there and collect my thoughts and know, you know, this is what we're doing is so important. We'll master any problem. We're going to get through this and figure this out. And at the end of the day, we did. We had a great team and we all worked together and we, and we made it happen. I, I can't even put into words how proud I am. of it. That's terrific. Doug, how has being involved in the Ellis Island and Liberty Island projects impacted your life? It's it impacted it a lot. It meant a lot. It always meant a lot to me. 
I always wanted to do something in my life that wasn't just, I, I was an economics major. I could have gone to Wall Street. I could have done a lot of things maybe, but I always wanted to do something that, hey, at the end of the day, I could point to something, you know, hey, I built that. That's what I did today. But to be able to point to a historic monument to say, hey, at Ellis Island Museum, I, I built that. Or to go out there, it, it's emotional and mind boggling to me to be able to look at that museum and say, I still have to pinch myself that, you know, my firm did that, that, that we built that. I, it's, it's hard to imagine. So it's changed my life in that I know I've accomplished something that my grandkids can look at, their kids can look at, it will be there. It, it means a lot. It means something that I know, you know, people would be proud of what I did. And for my firm, it, it was a game changer. People saw who we were and what we could do and through the publicity we got and all those things that come with it. I don't have to convince anybody that I could build their building anymore. I just point to what we did at the museum and, and nobody asks any more questions. It's not a, can you build this? Those questions are out the window. It becomes the normal things is how much it's going to cost. But that obstacle is done for us. Everybody knows what we can do because we did something that I personally don't think a lot of firms could have done. And we got it done. When I think of somebody saying, well, what's your resume? Let's see what you've done. All you have to do is point to the statue. Of right. Yes. <laughs> and, it's, and, and that's the only question. And then it, it moves on to different things quickly. And, and back in 2008, 9, 10, when we were first in the, that wasn't the case. We had to convince people every time that we could do this. And, and we don't have to do that anymore, which is big. But it's really been life-changing for me as far as... Uh, what I know I accomplished now and, and all those things that came around it along with it. It was, and it was an exciting time that the grand opening period was a very exciting time for, for not only me, but my family and, and all the people that work here. It was very exciting. Definitely. I want to thank you for sharing your story with us. I'm expecting to hear of some other incredibly historically significant place that you're going to renovate. We're, we're, we're trying. We're always, we're always looking for new stuff. A lot that's going on in New Jersey right now, renovating some of these old buildings in Newark and in Patterson. It, there's some great historic buildings around that really have been shuttered. There's a couple great theaters in Newark that I'm hoping to get involved with, partnering with the New Jersey Devils that want to renovate these things. And I think there's more to come. There's more to come. I don't know if I could ever top the Statue of Liberty, but there's certainly more historic renovations in our future. Well, thank you again, Doug. And I hope that you have a really wonderful day and thank you again for being a guest on our show. Oh, you're welcome. It was great to be here and great to have this conversation. Thank you. I can't wait to get out there. I'm going to be looking for chicken bones all over the place. Look all over the ground. You'll find them. So, <laughs> they're out there. So for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.